have to thank Fred White for uh, uh, letting me know the proper pronunciation of the names here. And I will do my best not to, uh, even though I speak no Russian, to make sure that I pronounce them as well. Interestingly, uh, it's uh, Vavilov, Vavilov and Lysenka are the, uh, the pronunciations. I've heard a, num a number of different pronunciations, but uh, those, are the, uh, those are the correct ru uh, Russian pronunciations. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, I think, one of the, uh, actually not just one, but a series of, of stories and, and events that come together in what turns out to be both one of the most tragic as well as one of the most heroic episodes in the history of science. And uh, it's unfortunately uh, an episode that not many people are aware of, where, where science, history, politics, uh, education, a number of things come together. And uh, uh, to, to illustrate what uh, the, the devotion and the passion that some scientists have for their, for their professions, as well as the, the tragedy that comes from uh, political interference when a political ideology comes into play. Now, the two key players in this presentation will be Nikolai uh, Vavilov and, uh, and Trofim uh, Lysenka, and uh, uh, one uh, Vavilov, who was uh, one of the most prominent geneticists in the history of the science, and then uh, 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 Lysenko, who was then probably the most notorious uh, case of, uh, of a pseudogeneticist in, in the history of the science, and, their, uh, and then the contention that they, uh, that they had when, uh, when they came together. Uh, to understand this, we need to have a little bit of a background, and we'll go back as far as uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who was a, uh, a French naturalist, who was actually one of the pioneering figures in developing the theory of evolution. He's usually badmouthed by, uh, by scientists because the idea that he came up with, or the one he's remembered most for, is uh, one that is called the... Uh, uh, the Lamarckism or the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And the basic idea there that he, that he put forward, which made sense at the time, was that, uh, that organisms could evolve, but the, the way they evolved was that the environment somehow influenced their physical makeup and then their physical makeup can then be transmitted through generations and over a period of generations they could gradually change under the influence of the environment. <laughs> it's actually not all that different from natural selection except that in natural selection we don't look at the environment as directing the selection but rather the uh, mutations and variability being there and then the environment serves as, as in a sense the selective agent that, uh, that favors or disfavors certain organisms for their survival and ultimately reproduction so that they then pass on the inherited characteristics that they have. And that's really the major difference that we see here. Uh, but Lamarck certainly had a profound influence on the development of evolutionary theory and, and, and also the development of, of an understanding of inheritance. And I think it's unfair to, uh, uh, to look at him as, in a sense, a, a bad figure in the history of genetics and evolution. And in fact, Charles Darwin had uh, read Lamarck, had quite a great deal of admiration for him, and if you read Origin of Species, there really is a surprising amount of Lamarckism in it. Uh, Darwin did not have a good grasp of inheritance because he was completely unaware of the work that Mendel had done. And uh, uh, some science historians have speculated that if Darwin and Mendel had come together in this great meeting of the minds, that uh, our understanding of evolution would have been uh, greatly enhanced at a much earlier period. As it turned out, the, the uh, Darwinism and Mendelism really didn't come together, as I'll show in a few moments, uh, until the 1930s. That's when we have a period called the modern synthesis. Uh, another key player in, this, in the historical context is Gregor Mendel who conducted a series of experiments on uh, peas and beans in the uh, 1850s, late 1850s, right up into the early uh, 1860s. And from those experiments, he 
discovered the what are the fundamental patterns of inheritance that apply not just to the plants he was studying but to multicellular organisms in general and in fact the the basic principles of inheritance that applied to pea plants that he discovered uh, are also the same that we see in humans as well as most other organisms and uh, uh, Mendel, unfortunately, during his lifetime was not recognized for his scientific work. There were a few people who were aware of what he had done. Uh, several publications uh, during the late 1800s that cited his work, but no one recognized it for the power that it had and the fundamental principles of, of inheritance that it established. Uh, Mendel died in 1884 uh, before his work was known. And then in... Um, in 1900, uh, three botanists, uh, in essence, rediscovered his work. What they were doing was they were conducting experiments with plants. They independently discovered the same principles that Mendel had without being aware of what he had done. And then, uh, and then each of them, it appears that Carl Korins was the first, uh, found Mendel's paper and realized that Mendel had done this work uh, uh, essentially 35 years earlier. And, uh, and had published it. And from 1900 on, Mendel then became known as the founder of the science of genetics. And uh, uh, some people claim that Shermock was uh, not one of the rediscoverers, that he really didn't grasp Mendelism. I've read his paper. I'm convinced that, uh, that he really should be included among the, uh, the three rediscoverers. Now, someone who is also often included as a rediscoverer, who really wasn't, but became Mendel's greatest proponent opponent was William Bateson. Uh, Bateson was a British naturalist. He had been studying inheritance and there's this great story about him being on a train and reading Mendel's paper and almost being, almost undergoing a, a kind of quasi-religious conversion to Mendelism. He, uh, according to his own account, he was on the train on the way to give a lecture and he completely changed his lecture after reading the paper and gave this lecture on Mendelism. And from that point, he became Mendel's greatest proponent. Now, interestingly, some of the greatest scientific ideas become established out of controversy. And that was certainly the case with Mendelism. Uh, there were uh, 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 some scientists known as the biometricians who really developed their ideas right around the same time, right around 1900, the, the leaders being Carl Pearson and W.F.R. Weldon, who, uh, who felt that evolution proceeded in a very gradual way. Uh, Bateson saw uh, inheritance of discrete characteristics as being the predominant mechanism. And those two seem to be in conflict. Now, interestingly, later they, uh, and in fact, even within the, the decade, they came together uh, where scientists showed that uh, Mendelian inheritance could certainly explain the gradual distribution of, of characteristics we see, such as height in humans, which is not tall or short, but rather uh, a wide range of, of characteristics. Uh, but because of that controversy, Bateson and a number of his followers conducted a whole series of experiments that strongly established uh, Mendelism as a, uh, a clear-cut uh, mechanism for inheritance and they showed that it worked in a wide range of organisms, plants and animals. And, uh, and their work was very foundational then in, in, in establishing the science of genetics. And Bateson comes into play as a very key uh, person in this uh, Vavilov-Lysenka uh, contention uh, because Vavilov was one of Bateson's students. He left Russia to study, or the Soviet Union at the time, to study under Bateson, and Bateson was his, uh, his principal mentor. And so Vafilov became uh, a very prominent Mendelian during this time of, uh, of the establishment of, of, of Mendelism. Now, interestingly, if we look at the uh, Darwin's and Mendel's ideas on how the environment influences inheritance, we see a very strong contrast here. Darwin wrote in Origin of Species, it seems pretty clear that the organic beings must be exposed during the several generations to the new conditions of life to cause any appreciable amount of variation, and that when the organization has once begun to vary, it generally continues to vary for many generations. Now what we see in here is kind of a quasi-Lamarckian point of view. Darwin is saying that, you'll notice he uses the word cause, uh, 
and uh, that, uh, that the conditions of life, which we presume is the environment here, uh, cause variation and then after several generations that variation can appear. Now interestingly, um, uh, here's where my personal involvement comes into this. I have the great opportunity to, uh, to study Mendel's copy of Darwin's Origin of Species, where Mendel had made uh, uh, marginal notes. And interestingly, no one had published that, and so we had the opportunity to publish those notes. Uh, uh, Bryce Ridding, who uh, is in the Department of Music, and I uh, were able to do that. And uh, Mendel marked this passage. It, it clearly was of interest to him. And we can see that interest emerging <coughs> in his classic paper, where he, in, his, in essence, counters this very passage. Uh, and the following, if the change in conditions of life were the sole cause of variability, one would expect that those cultivated plants that have been grown through centuries under almost identical conditions should have regained stability. This is known not to be the case, for it is precisely among them that we not only, uh, that not only the most different, but also the most variable forms are found. Mendel is arguing, in essence, against this point of Darwin's and against the neo-Lamarckian point of view here, uh, that uh, the environment is, is really not the, the, the cause of, of variability. And that those two contrasting ideas really form much of the heart of the Vavila Vlisenka contention that uh, comes into play later, which is why we're going through them now. Another key historical event that took place concurrent with the, uh, with the events in uh, the Soviet Union was what we now call the modern synthesis. And the modern synthesis was the, bringing, the, the, the full bringing together of Mendelism and Darwinism, where Mendel's laws essentially explain Darwin's theory of natural selection. That's the, that's the basic point here. And uh, there were a number of scientists that uh, brought that about. Four of them, uh, four of the, of the most important players are illustrated here. J.B.S. Haldane, who is certainly worth a, an entire seminar or a book uh, alone, given the, uh, his, his photograph, I think, illustrates very well his, his personality. Uh, he, ended up, uh, he ended up, by the way, uh, uh, emigrating to India and wearing uh, uh, Indian clothing. Uh, uh, and then also we have Sewell Wright, who is an American geneticist. Uh, Ronald Fisher down in the, the lower left corner, who was a British uh, statistician, one of the founders of the science of statistics, also a very prominent geneticist. And then also another key person, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who was Russian and who emigrated to the United States. And in largely because of the way uh, of, of what uh, Lysenko was doing in the Soviet Union, refused to return to his home country and ended up becoming a naturalized American citizen and one of the most prominent geneticist evolutionary biologists in the history of the United States. And uh, the four of them, along with others, were key in bringing this synthesis of Darwinism and mentalism together. So if we look at the early Mendelians, there were really two major groups, one European, one American, and uh, the unquestioned <coughs> leaders of those groups during this, this time period were William Bateson and Thomas Hunt Morgan. And their names come into play a little bit later in the presentation as well. Uh, I've listed some of the geneticists, certainly not all of them, who. Uh, who worked, uh, worked in these groups. And uh, interestingly, you'll notice I've listed at the top, uh, this was a time in science when uh, women didn't play a prominent role. Genetics is a big exception to that. One, because Bateson was teaching at a women's college. Uh, he was at the John Innes Center in England, but was also teaching at a women's college and recruited quite a number of women geneticists. And so we have people like, uh, uh, like uh, Muriel Welldale and Edith Saunders who, who become uh, important geneticists during that time. Uh, Reginald Punnett, after whom the Punnett Square is named. Uh, French geneticist Lucien Quinault, Carl Korins, Eric von Schirmach, who were two of Mendel's rediscoverers. Interestingly, uh, uh, De Vries became a, a 
uh, sort of a non-Mendelian very shortly after he had rediscovered Mendel's work. Uh, Ronald Fisher in, in Britain and then I've uh, highlighted in uh, italics some of the people who come into play a little bit later here. Theodosius Dobzhansky, Nikolai Vavilov and uh, then also uh, you know, on the American side uh, Lillian von Sampson was one of Morgan's students who contributed much to what we understand about fruit flies and ended up marrying him and uh, which is why uh, Morgan is listed as her fourth name there. And then uh, Barbara McClintock who worked with Rollo Emerson but also had very strong contacts with Morgan. Emerson being a Cornell professor who, who established corn as one of the key uh, uh, organisms in, uh, in establishing Mendelian genetics. Calvin Bridges who worked under Morgan and I've highlighted his name in italics because Bridges was a communist sympathizer as were a number of others including uh, uh, Herman Mueller. Uh, and in fact, uh, Morgan's most prominent students were, uh, uh, were, were Bridges, Mueller, and uh, Alfred Sturtevant. And of those three, two of them were very strong communist uh, sympathizers and very interested in what was going on in the Soviet Union. And then also Sewell Wright, uh, William Castle, and Kurt Stern listed in here. And by the way, Dwayne Jeffrey is with us and he knew some of these people personally. And, uh, and has some great stories to tell. The, uh, now let's uh, go to Vavilov and, uh, and a bit of the chronology. Now on the chronologies that I've listed here, I'll give one for him and also for Lysenka, but the, uh, uh, the chronologies, even though they end here right around 1940, the reason I've ended them there is that that's really in the 1930s and the 40s where the two of them come together and where the, the contention itself begins. And so these chronologies do not go through the ends of their lives, although Vavilov is, is really pretty close uh, at, this, at this point. He died in 1943. Uh, anyway, he was born in, uh, in Moscow, 1887. In 1910, graduated from the Moscow Agricultural Institute as a plant, uh, as a botanist. And uh, he studied, he then went to England 1913 to 1914, studied with Bateson, and that's really where he became a strong Mendelian, is that Bateson had a, a powerful influence on him, and in fact, uh, Bateson and, uh, and Vavilov uh, maintained correspondence and visited each other uh, uh, later in, uh, in Vavilov's career. Uh, he then became a professor at the Saratov Ag Agricultural Institute and published studies on the origin of cultivated plants, which was one of the key publications that he uh, that he made uh, by the 1920s. He was the leading geneticist and certainly uh, leading botanist, uh, one of the leading scientists in the Soviet Union. Uh, had great support from Lenin, and uh, and which uh, after uh, let's see, Lenin died in 24, was it? Yeah, 1924 was when Lenin's death was, and then in 1926, Vavilov received the uh, Lenin Prize. 1937, he had uh, uh, the the world was going to gather, the world of geneticists was going to gather in Moscow for the International Congress of Genetics. Uh, as we'll see, Stalin canceled that, but uh, Vavilov was really at the height of his career in the 1920s, going into the or early 1930s, very well respected in the Soviet Union as well as throughout the world as a, as a leading geneticist. And uh, one of his greatest contributions was during the period 1916 to 1940 when he made expeditions throughout the world to collect seeds as well as tubers of uh, different types of plants and he brought those back to the Soviet Union as a way of collecting the world's genetic diversity for cultivated plants and uh, there's a very good reason for that. Here are some uh, photographs of Vavilov in, in his uh, in his many expeditions throughout the world where he was uh, collecting these seeds and bringing them back. And the reason for this is he came up with an idea that is still very valid and very important for plant geneticists, plant breeders, and really for the entire world because our entire food supply depends on this on this concept. And it's uh, an idea that we now call genetic erosion. and. Uh, the perhaps one of the best illustrations of it that I've chosen to use here is the potato. The potato originated in Andean South America, largely in the in the high Andes of uh, Bolivia and Peru. And if you go there even today, 
the different types of potatoes that you see will look very much like uh, this lower photograph right here. Incredible genetic variety of potatoes. When the Spaniards arrived, and, and what had happened then is that the ancient civilizations of that part of the world had domesticated the potato from wild ancestors. And they had this tremendous diversity there so that there were little varieties that were adapted to the various microclimates of this highly varied region in the mountains. And uh, so incredible diversity for potatoes. When the Spaniards arrived, they took potatoes back to Europe. Not all of them grew well there. They only took a subset back. And so the genetic diversity in Europe for potatoes was substantially less than it was in, uh, in Peru. And then potatoes became a tremendously important crop. Interestingly, the, the Soviet Union had, was and is one of the major po uh, potato producers in the world. And then potatoes made their way throughout Europe up into Ireland and then from there uh, to the United States. Of course, we have the great Irish potato famine that uh, has a great influence on uh, immigrants coming to the United States. And uh, then, and then uh, American breeders took the potatoes that they had coming in there and developed using modern plant breeding techniques based on Mendel's principles as well as Darwin's developed modern varieties that were much more productive than the native varieties that we see in uh, the Andes. Where the real danger of genetic erosion comes then is when these highly productive varieties that have very little genetic diversity go back to their region of origin and begin to displace that diversity because that diversity is the foundation for the future of plant breeding. Those genes that are contained within the area where a crop originated are so critical for plant breeders to use that the loss of those genes through genetic erosion is a huge loss to humanity. And Vavilov, or Vavilov was the one who recognized that. And because of that, he recognized that erosion was going on. And not only did he recognize it and publish it, but he took the action to collect that diversity and preserve it. And he brought those seeds, tubers, all of these other things back, uh, as well as cuttings from fruit trees, <coughs> back to the, the Soviet Union. And uh, there he established, uh, uh, oh, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, one of the theoretical things that came out of this, and well, theoretical and practical, is that Vavilov recognized that it was not throughout all of the world that plants were domesticated, but rather there were certain centers. Amazingly, and not coincidentally, these were the centers of major civil, ancient civilizations, where people, where advanced civilizations had developed, they were dependent on cultivated agriculture, and that is where domesticated plants and likewise animals. These same centers apply to domesticated animals. That's where they, uh, uh, that's where they appeared. And Vavilov recognized that those also are the centers where the diversity is going to be. His basic concept was that the greatest genetic diversity for a species typically is in the region where it originated, where it evolved. And for domesticated plants, then that would be the, pla the places where ancient civilizations domesticated those, those species. And so he identified eight centers, and we won't take the time to go through them, but you can see that they, uh, anyone who's familiar with ancient civilizations recognizes that each of those places had some very important ancient civilizations where the domestication uh, took place. Interestingly, though, what I will mention is that some of the foods that we now think of as being inherent to a particular area are not truly inherent to that area. For instance, what would Italian food be without tomatoes? And yet tomatoes originated in Mexico. And uh, potatoes, of course, are uh, an important worldwide food, but they originated in South America. Uh, most of the grains that we have, uh, wheat, oats, barley, uh, originated in, uh, in the Middle East. Rice, of course, in Southeast Asia, as we might expect, uh, corn in Mexico and to a lesser extent in South America. And uh, now, uh, <clears throat> They, uh, Vavilov, as I mentioned earlier, was very well known as a geneticist. Here's an example of Bateson visiting him uh, later on when he was at the height of his career in, uh, in the Soviet Union. He established this great center that, uh, where they kept and, and stored, like a museum, 
the diversity that he had collected, had quite a number of scientists uh, working with him, had plenty of funding from the government. It was uh, essentially an ideal situation. And then along comes uh, Lysenka. He was uh, born in 1898 and uh, was fairly obscure. And one of the things that brought him to uh, prominence was in 1927, a, uh, a, a Soviet reporter in Pravda wrote an article about him that praised what he was doing. And I'll quote from that uh, in the next slide. He then um, came up with a hypothesis of vernalization that was pretty much a Lamarckian type of hypothesis. Uh, it turned out that uh, Vavilov, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, Konstantinov, uh, close enough, uh, who was one of, uh, of Avila's students, uh, they went through a series, because at this time uh, Lysenko was getting a, a fair amount of attention for his hypothesis, they conducted a series of really fine experiments done on a large scale with good statistical analysis and it essentially disproved entirely the, uh, what uh, Lysenko was doing. Uh, and yet Lysenka gained Stalin's favor, was named president of the Academy of Agricultural Sciences and received the Stalin Prize in 1944. Now uh, here is this article that helped bring him to prominence. And in fact, if it weren't for a coincidence of a number of events, uh, Lysenka probably would have faded and in, in, uh, never even been mentioned in the pages of history, uh, but he ended up having a profound uh, negative, not just negative, but tragic effect, as we'll see. Here's the quotation from the story. It's a wonderful quotation. Uh, Lysenka gives one the feeling of a toothache. God give him health. He has, the, uh, he has a dejected mien, stingy of words and insignificant of faces. He, all one remembers is his sullen look creeping along the earth as if at very least he were ready to do someone in. <laughs> But then a little later in the article, this is the same article, the, the reporter turns the, uh, turns the table and says, the barefoot professor Lysenka has now followers, pupils, and experimental fields. He is visited in the winter by agronomic luminaries who stand before the green fields of the experiment station, gratefully shaking his hand. And uh, the what really brings Lysenka to power is that Stalin sees in Lysenka's ideas something that is truly Soviet that contradicts the Western tradition of Mendelism. And he then promotes Lysenka. And uh, this photograph here, I think, is, yeah, this is one of those cases where you hear of a, a picture telling a thousand words. This one really does it. Uh, you see Lysenka down here giving his speech, and then look at Stalin up in the corner uh, looking at him. Uh, the, in one of the speeches that, uh, and this photograph, by the way, is from 1935. I don't know that it is the very speech that we're looking at here, but it certainly depicts what, what we see. During this uh, speech, Lysenka said that Soviet geneticists, and he was targeting Vavilov in particular, uh, are kulak wreckers and saboteurs who, instead of helping collective farmers, they do their destructive business both in the scientific world and out of it. And after that just stinging speech, uh, Stalin arose, uh, the, the way the account of it goes, that he stood up, and I think that's great in this photo, you see him standing there uh, in power, and he says, bravo, comrade Lysenko, bravo. Uh, it's clear that he has this uh, tremendous support from, uh, uh, from the powerful dictator. Now, one of the key... Uh, one of the key uh, uh, concepts that uh, Lysenko put forth was the idea of, of vernalization. And what he claimed is that uh, to understand what he was talking about, there, were, there are two types of wheat, what we call spring wheat, which farmers plant in the spring. It then grows up into the late summer and, uh, and produces a crop. Or winter wheat, which they plant in the fall, and then it must undergo a process that we do call vernalization, where the growing plants have to be cold enough, be frozen enough, that uh, it triggers them then in the spring to grow and produce a wheat crop. And the wheat crop comes much earlier, and for that reason, uh, uh, winter wheat can be grown without uh, uh, 
uh, often without irrigation because it produces an earlier crop having germinated in the fall. And uh, what Lysenka contended is that by freezing, giving cold treatment to the seeds of winter wheat that they could be vernalized and become spring wheat. And uh, the experiments that uh, Vavilov and his students did showed very conclusively that Lysenko was wrong, that the environment did not change the genetics and convert winter wheat into spring wheat. And, uh, and yet uh, Lysenko's response to it, which is given in the second paragraph on this slide, is uh, Skantantinov must give thought to the fact that when such erroneous data were swept away from the field of scientific activity, those who failed to understand the implications of such data and insisted on retaining them were also swept away, which in a way is almost a, a prophecy of what's about to come. And that is the uh, geneticists were among the most affected of the purge that Stalin made of intellectuals during the uh, late 1930s. And, uh, and the fact that uh, Vavilov and his students are now contradicting Lysenko openly means that they are some of the primary targets and he's in essence here warning them what, uh, what is going to happen. Uh, Lysenko and then a, another uh, a philosopher named uh, Prezant, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, got together and launched a campaign against Vavilov, uh, which was supported by Stalin. And a number of the events are here, and I'm going to uh, read some quotations that illustrate some of the, uh, some of the points during this time. Lysenko becomes even more uh, Lamarckian during this period. Here's a quote that illustrates, I think, very clearly what he is trying to promote as the doctrine of genetics of this time. Heredity is inherent not only in the chromosomes, but in every particle of the living body. And you need but change the type of metabolism in a living body to bring about a change in heredity. And then in 1937, he publicly names Vavilov as an enemy of the people. In 1937, Stalin cancels the International Congress of Genetics, which was organized by Vavilov, scheduled to be held in Moscow, and then he ramps up his purge of intellectuals who are sent to prison or executed, among them uh, dozens of geneticists and, who refused to accept uh, Lysenko. And then uh, 1939, here's a nice quotation that well illustrates what is going on at this time. Our native geneticists, those attempting to defend the truths of, Mendel of Mendelism Morganism, notice he brings Thomas Hunt Morgan, the American, into this, should take pause over the significant fact that the philosophical foundations of the theory they defend had already found a place in the history of pseudoscience. The struggle against the remnants of bourgeois opinions in science, the implacable struggle against pseudoscience and the idealistic and metaphysical distortions in the business of every scientist and every scientific institution in the land. You know, these are powerful words. They sound very much, uh, you, you can sense the, the, the Stalinist uh, doctrine that, uh, that comes through in these and can see why Stalin was, uh, was so supportive of it. In, uh, 1938, Lysenko is appointed as president of the Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Two of the most prominent geneticists in the world have ties to the Soviet Union. Seeing what's going on, Hermann Mueller, who was an American who actually was fired from the University of Texas for his communist views, he went to the Soviet Union and had planned to stay there. Uh, recognizing what was going on, he left, ended up going and, uh, and assisting with the Spanish Civil War uh, in the, uh, those who were fighting against Franco and then ended up, up in the, back in the United States, never returning again to the Soviet Union. Theodosius Stobzhansky, who was a Soviet citizen himself, uh, refused to return to his homeland and, and stayed in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, becoming one of the most prominent uh, geneticists and evolutionary biologists. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey, you knew 
Dobzhansky, didn't you, or met him? Yes. Yeah. We, we hosted him over at BYU. Versus yeah. Uh, and just a, a remarkable scientist who, who was one of the most prolific geneticists in history. And it's, it, it's something to think what he would have done for Russia had he returned to his homeland. But this entire, uh, this entire contention then uh, led him to, uh, was one of the major factors that led him to the United States and, and uh, caused him to stay there. Uh, Vavilov, on the other hand, was a very strong patriot to the Soviet Union and, uh, and also very, uh, uh, very committed to promoting uh, science and particularly his own science of genetics. And in a speech he gave in 1939 attacking Lysenka comes one of the greatest quotes I think ever uttered in the history of science and in a way a uh, likewise a, 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 a prophecy of what was to come. He said, we shall go to the pyre, we shall burn, but we shall not retreat from our convictions. And he and uh, the other geneticists who were there uh, were true to their word. They stood staunchly against uh, Lysenka uh, in the full knowledge that they were likely to be imprisoned and possibly executed or killed or die in prison as a consequence, and yet remained uh, uh, remained devout to the, uh, the science with Vavila being the leader. And uh, tragically and not surprisingly, uh, not long after that, 1940, uh, Vavilov is arrested. And uh, this is an example of his mugshot at the time of his arrest. He's taken to, the, uh, uh, to prison in Leningrad, where interestingly he continued to teach and to write. Uh, about genetics and um, and then in 1941 uh, this is during World War II and we have uh, one of the uh, one of the most tragic events in the history of the war which is this 900 day siege of Leningrad when Hitler's army cuts off the city entirely in anticipation of that uh, prisoners were moved from prisons in Leningrad out of fear that they might be released. Uh, Vavilov was one of them. He was moved to Saratov prison uh, where he died of, uh, of malnourishment and starvation in 1943. Let's now return to the siege of Leningrad because an important story uh, connected with Vavilov and to a lesser extent with Lysenka comes out of this. And uh, during the siege of Leningrad, it was most severe during the winter of 41 to 42. There were over 200,000 people who died of starvation during that time. Uh, the Nazi army had uh, completely cut the city off from its uh, supplies. There, uh, these are some photographs that uh, depict how, and there are literally hundreds of photographs like these that, uh, that depict the great tragedy of this siege. Uh, this photograph, I think, is uh, this is sort of a, uh, 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 a Russian version of Anne Frank, uh, a young girl who recorded in her diary the dates at which each of a number of her relatives died of starvation in Leningrad uh, because of this great siege. Uh, the siege took place over a period of 900 days. Water, electricity, fuel supplies were cut off. Uh, during January of 42, when it was at its worst, food was rationed to 125 grams of bread. That's less than a slice of bread per day per person. It also included sawdust that they banned yeah. into it. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, uh, just unimaginable uh, how, how awful this was for the uh, civilians. When, by the time the siege had ended, more than 641,000 civilians had died and uh, at least 200,000 during the winter of 41 to 42. Now, uh, you'll recall that uh, the institute that Vavilov had established was in Leningrad. And what did it contain? Seeds. Seeds. It contained food collected seeds that had the genetic diversity of the world represented there to protect the world against genetic erosion. And the seeds were not enough to make any kind of an impact 
on the uh, the population. If they were, you know, if they took the seeds out and distributed them to the people, uh, they'd probably all be eaten within a day and and have have very little impact. But certainly for the workers who were there, this could be a source that could keep them from starving. They could they could have eaten those seeds. The uh, but what they did is they made a pact among themselves. They all gathered and said, they promised one another that they would not eat the seeds and in order to enforce it, in fact, they, they made an agreement among themselves that no one would ever be alone. They would always be at least in groups of two so that they would be watching out for each other to make sure that the, that the heritage, the genetic heritage that Vivilov had collected would be preserved. And there are some wonderful quotes that come out of this. Uh, Vadim uh, Lenkovich, who was one of the scientists at the Institute who survived, uh, uh, said this. He said, it was hard to walk. It was unbearably hard to get up every morning, to move your hands and feet. But it was not in the least difficult to refrain from eating up the collection, for it was impossible to think of eating it up. For what was involved was the cause of your life, the cause of your comrades' lives. They were devoted enough to that that they refused to eat the food. And the uh, tragedy as well as heroism that came out of this is that nine of them died of starvation. Died of starvation. Uh, some of them at their posts surrounded by food. The, uh, there's a, a nice passage that comes from a recently released book called Where Our Food Comes From that comes from interviews of the, of the survivors who were there at the Institute. He said, among this group, Alexander Strukin died at his writing table holding in his hand a packet of his most prized peanuts that he had hoped to send off for a grow out. The custodian of Avilov's many collections, Lilia Rodina, died of starvation, as did Dmitry Ivanov, who at as his own life failed, stowed away thousands of packets of rice that he held so dear. There were others as well, Stengelov, Kovalevsky, uh, Lanjevsky, Malagina, Korzun, some who, who, who perished by starving, some riddled by sickness, others by shrapnel. Wolf, the herbarium curator, was hit by a missile shell fragment and bled to death. Gliber, the archivist of, of Avilov's field notes, died in the midst of those papers rather than leave his post. Now, once the war had ended, uh, Lysenka by then was, had pretty much eliminated most of his enemies, the students of the geneticists who had, uh, uh, who had been imprisoned, many of whom had died by now. Uh, uh, tended to, to keep quiet and um, and then a number of scientists in an attempt to please Lysenka actually published false papers and so we have this quote from uh, Joris Medvedev who, who wrote an expose on, on Lysenka uh, where he said in nearly every issue of the journal Agrobiologia Articles appeared in which there were seriously reported transformations of wheat into rye and vice versa, barley into oats, peaches into vetch, vetch into lentils, cabbage into swedes, firs into pines, hazelnuts into hornbeams, alders into birches, sunflowers into strangleweed. All of these communications were utterly without proof, methodologically illiterate, and thoroughly unreliable. The authors had one leading thought to please Lysenka. And then, uh, it was not unknown outside of the Soviet Union what was going on. Ronald Fisher, as I mentioned, one of the uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, uh, one of the founders of of statistics and a, a geneticist said, after examining Lysenka's arguments, I have no doubt that we cannot, as many have been inclined to do, describe him simply as a scientific crank or simply as a wrong-headed yokel. His mind does not seem to work in either of these ways. No, I cannot believe that the reward of Lysenka's triumphant career is the advance of scientific knowledge, nor that it is the prosperity of poor peasants. The reward he so eagerly is grasping is power, power for himself, power to threaten, power to torture, power to kill. And uh, one of the great tragedies of this is that it was not confined to the Soviet Union, but uh, that Lysenkoism uh, went into China. 
Mao adopted it, uh, mandated that it be used in, in Chinese agriculture, and the ultimate result of that was famine during the late 50s and early 60s in China. So not only did people die at the hand of the executioners, many died of starvation because of uh, false science being promoted. Now, one of the great heroes in this story, too, is Georges Medvedev, who was a Soviet uh, scientist and activist, and a great risk to his own personal life in the 60s. He wrote exposés, one of which was an exposé of Lysenka, which he sent in Russian, got it smuggled out of the Soviet Union, translated into English, and published as a book called The uh, Rise and Fall of T.D. Lysenko, which is a, a book well worth reading. And uh, then Lysenko fell from power uh, at about the time that Khrushchev did. Uh, Khrushchev supported him, but uh, at that point, Soviet, not biologists, but physicists, began to speak out against him. Among them was Andrei Sakharov, who said, uh, he is responsible for the shameful backwardness of Soviet biology and genetics in particular, for the dissemination of pseudoscientific views, for adventurism, for the degradation of learning, and for defamation, firing, arrest, even death of many genuine scientists. Uh, there are two really fine books out. One of them is Medvedev's book on the rise and fall of Lysenka, and then another one recently released called The Murder of Nikolai Vavilov. Uh, by Peter Pringle, a British author, that uh, came out just a few years ago. I've read both of them. They are both excellent books, well worth uh, getting and reading. Now, I've intentionally, Lysenka by this point was uh, uh, essentially banished. Uh, he had, had fallen into disrepute, and so I put in very small print here, he dies in 1976. Now, to end, though, I have, as a little bit of an epilogue, I have to share a personal story. Uh, the first time that I went to uh, visit uh, Mendel's garden, which is the, uh, the pilgrimage that every geneticist should make, uh, I, uh, it was four years after the fall of communism. His garden is located in what's now the Czech Republic in the city of Brno. And uh, as I was there, the uh, director of the Mendel Museum, uh, they had just put up a display of the Soviet scientists who had been, uh, uh, who had died under Lysenkoism. And uh, the, uh, and she told me a personal story of how now that people were free to travel, that many of the students of these scientists then made their own pilgrimage to Mel Mendel's garden, collected a bit of soil from the garden, and then took it back and scattered it on the graves of their mentors. And hearing this story, I thought I can't resist. And so I went out and collected some soil myself. Uh, I have to apologize. I, I have it in a vial up in my desk. I was going to bring it and show it to you, and I forgot to do it. Uh, but I have a little vial on my desk of, of Mendel's soil, uh, remembering the, as, a, as a way of honoring and remembering those Soviet scientists who died uh, as a result of this. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention, and any questions you have, I'd be happy to take. Give some examples of how the syncretism led to famine. Uh, in the case of China, the idea was that uh, the, the the main thing that happened there is that they mandated that the people that if seeds could grow close to one another, if you get a lot of plants in there, they were supposed to influence their own genetics and change. And so Mao mandated that they plant far too many seeds. That they put them in just extremely. Uh, uh, compacted uh, plantings, and uh, and what it did, of course, is it meant that the that the plants would compete with one another, and they produced a much lower harvest. And uh, what actually happened is that some of the pe peasants knew that this was wrong, but when Mao would come to look at the gardens, they would actually go ahead of him, and they would take rice plants, transplant them in there to put them in uh, in a very high density, so that it looked like these productive plants were doing well. And then after he had passed, they would go in and pull them out so that the plants would still grow well. Uh, but that was one of the main things that happened in China that resulted in, in famine, is that they were, uh, they were following uh, misguided practices that substantially reduced the yields. Yeah. So I, I'm, not, I'm not, I come from the humanities and political sciences, mm -hmm. so excuse me if I'm, it's a silly question. Um, so if I understood well, Lysenko, through the process of vernalization, when he was 
the, the, the principle that he was relying on was Lamarck's principle of, uh, of the fact that, the, if I understood this well, the only cause for genetic change within a species is the environment. So he was saying, well, let's modify the environment, and that way we... And that way you modify the genetics. You see, and if you look at it in terms of, uh, well, go, uh, we'll, uh, go ahead and ask your question, sorry. No, that, that, was, that was the question. Am I, am, I, am I thinking about Lamarck properly? Is yes, yes, uh -huh. uh, absolutely. How does that compare with like, the current Mendelian? Uh, yeah, the idea now is that, uh, that what happens is that mutations occur in DNA and the environment may introduce them, but it doesn't target specific genes. In other words, the environment does not direct the, the course of, of mutation. In other words, it does not shape the genetic material. The genetic material can change, and, uh, but it does so not, not necessarily in response to a particular environmental effect to make it that. In other words, what Lysenko is proposing is that you could take winter wheat and genetically convert it to spring wheat simply by making it cold, which does not happen. You do that, and it still remains winter wheat. And, uh, and uh, Mendelism is, is very different than that. And in fact, interestingly, if you look at it, uh, what Vavilov did is that he collected diversity for this very reason that environment does not change it. If Lysenkoism worked, you wouldn't need to collect diversity because you could just take whatever you have, put it there, and the diversity would arise on its own in response to the environment. And uh, the diversity that we need to collect then is, is Unessential, but of course that's not the case. So Go just, ahead. just just follow up just to make sure that I, I've mm -hmm. clarified this well enough. Um, so, for example, with the forest here in Utah, there's certain like plants that come up only when there's a forest fire, right? It's something that hatches them up. But when that fire happens, or the same way the same way that the spring wheat happens, the environment does not actually change the the, the, the genetic. Does not form. change the genetic material. The genetic no. Material is just responding to the environment, but it's not really being changed, it's just reacting. Yeah, right? and, yeah and in fact, a, a way to think of uh, Lamarckism is that if you, if you go and weight lift, your muscles get larger, but you don't pass that on to your children. Your children don't grow up with larger muscles because you've been weightlifting. That's a good way to think of it. Okay, I think our time is probably gone. Uh, one more question. I might share just one little story about your yeah. death. Uh, I was at Berkeley doing graduate work at the time that he smuggled that manuscript out to Michael Lerner. Yeah. And you notice there was the translator. Yeah, Lerner was the translator. Lerner was Russian born, but he was a geneticist also at, at Berkeley at that time. And when Lerner translated that, he, he, he sent word back in, again smuggling to, like, to, to Medvedev, and said, we will publish this anonymously or your life is gone. Medvedev got word back and said, it must have my name or no one will ever believe it. And Lerner said, this has got to be the bravest act I have ever witnessed. Now, Medvedev ultimately managed to get out to, to Britain, as you know, and, and, and uh, finished his life there. But the comment from Lerner, this has got to be the bravest guy I've ever known, because he insisted it had to have his name, even though he would likely to be killed. You know, and, and to me, he is also one of the heroes in this, of the many heroes in this, in this whole period. Uh, the, uh, certainly, uh, the story, in fact, if you look at the subtitle that I, I put on this talk, it was very intentional. It's the tragedy, heroism, and passion for science. All three of them come through, uh, I think, like we have never seen in the history of science in this, in this whole episode. Thanks. Yeah, and I think it's uh, uh, quite an, an honor here to have someone who was, uh, who actually witnessed this and knew many of the characters in, in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>